and you know your name, uh, you can talk to Heidi and we can pretend and see if it's yours. Uh, we also have some glasses and some other odds and ends in Lost and Found. If you've lost and or found anything, uh, um, it's in no children. no children, no souls, but anything else will be delivered to registration, so go to registration and we can help you out. So anything else? Any other PSAs? Uh, no. Okay, perfect. Um, are we, we're good in the back? We are good. So um, I'm honored to introduce our keynote uh, tonight, uh, Donna Dotson. Uh, I'll say a, a few words about Donna and my experiences for just a few, just a few. I'm going to read a really long bio because um, that's what we all enjoy having. Um, when I first started working in this space, um, I remember reading NIST documents and, and, and seeing the work that NIST was doing and being really impressed with what was going on, the level of professionalism and the fact that there was someone in the public sector carrying the torch and caring about security in a way that I thought uh, made a difference. And I remember then getting the opportunity later in my career to do work at NIST and work with the staff there. And predominantly it was working with Donna and her staff and her organization over the years, which my, my, uh, my radio made that story really silly. but. Um, so I was always impressed with uh, Donna, the, her kind of strategic vision for what needed to happen in the industry, what needed to happen for government, how to engage private and public sector folks, um, but also kind of Donna's very personable, she's very human, um, and she put a face on an organization that for me had been kind of, uh, um, I wouldn't say faceless, but I didn't really know how to engage and interpret. And the, the welcoming environment that she had, I think, um, uh, really uh, gave me hope for the future of cybersecurity, which made me mortified one day when I'm in a meeting, and uh, this is when we were working on the Presidential Commission together, and we're sitting in a conference room, and uh, somebody from NIST says, all right, who has the phone that's called Unicorn Killer? And I said, oh, that's me. It's like, it's like I've seen it at every meeting, and I figured it must be one of us. I'm like, it's me. He's like, well, why do you have Unicorn Killer? I'm like, well, because I kill dreams. And, um, and Donna kind of turned pale, and I'm like, what? And apparently, and I'm, I'm probably telling the story a little wrong, but the, the part of the, the power and the magic of NIST is, is imbued upon it by a herd of unicorn that roam the campus, uh, independent of the deer. If you've ever been to NIST campus, there's a lot of captive deer, but apparently the unicorn are hiding behind the deer or something. But um, the power and, and, and the beauty of the unicorn helps NIST do good work. And so here I am as a contractor with my phone called Unicorn Killer, working with a bunch of NIST people, and I, I changed my phone name on the spot. I felt so bad, um, and hopefully, I, was, I, I you never saw it again. So I, I was, I was happy. Anyway, uh, without further ado, Donna Dotson. I'm gonna use this. Okay. I'm a walker. Right. Um, so um, I, I first of all, I want to thank Bruce and and Heidi for inviting me to come here. And I have to tell you all, I, I spent some time thinking. Why did they call and ask me to come up here, especially with the topic, right? And my first thought, and I haven't shared my notes with Bruce on, on this, but my first thought was maybe because I'm the only person he knows that he's never heard his favorite word come out of my mouth. <laughs> it's not part of my vocabulary, and he just couldn't fathom that. The second reason, I thought, goes back to the unicorn story. Um, seriously, it's in my notes here. Um, um, so we really had um, a, a good laugh at, at NIST one day. Um, somebody had written a blog about one of our documents that we had put out, and they said, the unicorns of NIST sprinkled their magic again and produced special publication 800 blah, blah, blah. And we walked around all day quite proud of ourselves as being unicorns. And so I thought, well, maybe Bruce wanted somebody from NIST up on stage to prove that there are real people here and that um, we are not really unicorns. So my, my friend Meltem and I from NIST um, are, are real, and the, the folks at NIST are real, although we have a, um, a, a much smaller group in, in uh, security than many of the other federal agencies who work in this space. And then the third reason I thought um, that he might have had me up here is because, like um, me, I, I am so impressed with the work my colleagues do at NIST. Um, 
And I, it's a great opportunity for me. I'm always the dumbest person in the room, so I'd feel good in this room, too, not just in rooms at NIST, by being the dumbest person. And, and um, I always learn stuff anywhere I go. So um, I've learned a lot today just being here and, and talking with the students. And, and our previous talk, Micah, I have to tell another Potter story, if, if you will. Um, Bruce and I were working on a, a project a couple of years ago. And do you remember the Pokemon thing that came back into phase and people were capturing Pokemon with their phone and they were walking around and in DC they were walking into the streets as they were trying to capture them with no idea about traffic. Well, I thought to myself when I heard this story, it really could only be somebody related to Bruce who would do this, but I'm, I'm not quite correct on that. So, so uh, someone in the Potter family, perhaps one of his children, also was interested in capturing Pokemon. And he actually um, wrote some code to be able to collect all the Pokemon on the East Coast between Washington, D.C. and New York City without ever leaving his house without ever leaving his house. So he figured out the pace that he needed to be walking and the GPS coordinates and, and that sort of thing. And what, what, a great, what a great household it must be to, to be in the, in the Potter household. They have dogs that know how to pack bags. And um, they, have, they have kids who can write um, um, detailed code as, as high school students. So, so we're thankful and lucky for all the great things that they do. Um, and I'm really honored to, to be up here. But also when I talked with Bruce, um, I said, well, thank you so much for the kind invitation to come and speak here. Um, what did you have in mind? And, and you have to understand, um, being the dumbest person in the room at NIST made me the head of the NIST cybersecurity program because all the smart people were too good to me. They didn't raise their hand to manage, and I was too slow to raise mine and say, no, I don't want to do that. So I actually used to do technical work, but he asked if I would kind of give an overview of where we've been in this space over the last 30 years and maybe some thoughts about where, where we're headed. And I thought, hmm, that's a pretty big ask with, with this group. Um, and with the previous technical talks, I started getting more and more and more nervous. So I had to step out of the room for a little while um, so that I could stand up here and, and speak to you all. But I had been working in the um, what used to be computer security space and then became information security. And today seems to be coined um, cybersecurity space um, since the uh, late 1980s. And I've seen an awful lot of interesting, fascinating changes in technology. It's been a really interesting time, but, but over the years, um, I've thought a lot about things that we're doing well and, and maybe some areas where we could improve. So as I think about technology changes, um, two big examples come into my mind. I had started at NIST in, in um, 87, and in 88, I was at a conference, and at the conference, somebody talked about um, the societal changes that we will see when a phone number is attached to a person rather than a device. And when you think about it, um, I can remember phones that were attached to a cord, and very often you had one in your, your um, kitchen, and you'd get a call, maybe you were 16 from a guy, and you were stretching that cord to, to get as far away from your family as you possibly could. And then, um, my son was born in 1990, and my husband got me one of these portable phones. Does anybody remember those? 
some, so I'm seeing some folks raise their hand. They were like boxes, sort of, and they plugged into your car into the cigarette lighter for power, but they were pretty clunky and heavy. And look at what we have today. So I've seen some of these pretty exciting changes. I, I remember when NIST, um, when we got our first portable computer that you could take home over the weekend and, and do some, some work at home, um, you really couldn't dial in through a modem at that time unless you had a special phone line. Um, I, I live in rural Gettysburg. So I actually had copper wires, so I couldn't detach um, and, and plug into a modem at that time. But these portable computers are really like, they were like the size of a sewing machine. They were like this big. Um, I, again, anybody ever see some of the first, anybody remember some of the fir first portable computers? I'm glad some of the old school people stayed for the keynote. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Um, so, so lots, lots and lots of changes um, have occurred during those 30 years. And I personally believe that those are the tip of the iceberg from the explosions that we're seeing today and that we'll see over the next 20 years. So technology off the charts and changes. Now let's get back to cybersecurity and um, some of the, the roots, the things that I think of the roots of cybersecurity. Um, in the computer security days, almost, other, almost all national governments around the world actually had um, investments in computer security. They were all coming from the national defense side. So it was kind of working with classified information and then, oh gee, maybe we need to do something in this space um, for unclassified. And, and, it, and it was all within the, the national defense realm. In the United States, we were the only country that I'm aware of that actually did a separation of computer security and had the National Security Agency um, looking at, at um, the Department of Defense and providing those security capabilities for them. And NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, actually was responsible for, at that time, sensitive but unclassified information. And that was a, for the US federal government. That was a big shift. NIST got into the computer security game. Why? Because the financial services sector needed, um, wanted to be able to use cryptography because they were starting to network and doing some work in, in wholesale banking where they were shifting money overnight electronically, but they did not have some of the security tools that they needed. And in particular, at that time, you could end up with um, what, what that industry thought to be sound cryptographic algorithms if you had the right security tickets, but they were all for classified use. Or you could um, have something that was homegrown and had not been tested and had not been looked at, and they were not comfortable with that. So NIST, um, one of its um, first things it did, the computer security program was established in, in 1973, and we came out with the, the data encryption standard right around um, 1976. I was not there for that. I'm old, but not that old. Um, so um, here we see the, the foundations and the roots again back into a lot of the work that was done coming from that um, national defense side, though, with the, with the development of the, in, and the knowledge of cryptography and that sort of thing being um, primarily for national defense issues. I also remember um, spending a fair amount of time looking at the rainbow series of documents. Anyone, anyone ever look at the orange book? 
Ah, yes. So we remember the Orange Book days in the, in the Rainbow series. I think the Red Book was um, on networking. I might be wrong about that. I've got a copy of, we've got a copy of those documents somewhere back at, at NIST, but I haven't looked at them in, in years. However, um, they were really looking at how do you build a trusted system? How do you build a trusted system? How do you do, do build a trusted computing platform? And they came from a defense perspective when the role and soul of that device was to support security operations. Okay, so now let's go back and think a little bit about what we've talked about. We've seen the explosion of technology where um, um, when it was first used, um, it was just a, a group of curious and interested technologists to where we are today. And we think back of the roots in computer security and the money that went into research and development, a lot of that came um, at, from that national defense perspective. So a lot of our foundations and a lot of the looks that we have still in this space really kind of come back to some of those roots. But NIST um, had a, a, a different take on things with the development of DES, um, with our work in standards bodies, and over time, building that relationship with industry, because after all, NIST is part of the Department of, U.S. Department of Commerce, non-regulatory agency. Um, but, but looking at um, working with this community and, and having an open and transparent process. So a lot of times when we were at national meetings with other governments, we were kind of the odd, odd group out, really. And we did a lot of work um, in three major areas at that time. Um, one of them was in the area of risk management. And we continue to follow that theme at NIST today with all of our work. A lot of work in cryptography with the data encryption standard and later on working um, a few years later on uh, message authentication codes, MACs, um, the precursor with symmetric key cryptography with hashes. Um, a lot of work in key management and writing it down uh, some principles around key management, but guess what? Key management is still hard and still <laughs> almost in, impossible to do. I was talking with two gentlemen just before I um, got up here, and I said, gee, maybe I should really be talking about the history of, of cryptographic key management. I might incite this audience more than, than this general high-level fluffy talk. Um, but um, writing that down and, and working on that, and then... Um, Another theme that we still see in cybersecurity today, and it's something that Bruce talked about in, um, earlier, and that is the conversation, the outreach conferences and things like that. NIST and NSA co-hosted the National Computer Security Conference for about 20 years. So basically, there were two major conferences in computer security back in the 80s and um, 70s and late 80s and maybe very, very early. I know it was early 90s. Um, my son was born the week of the National Computer Security Conference, and my boss was really irritated with me for not coming downtown to help out with the conference, because these kind, putting on these kinds of conferences are a lot of work. Um, so there was the Oakland Conference, and then there was the NCSA. So that outreach component has always been critically important. But at that time, the community was much, much smaller. Um, I, as I mentioned, I, I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. My husband's a veterinarian. And so when I'm at a social event in Gettysburg, very often, for many years, people would say, and what do you do again? I work in computer security. Oh, oh. Well, let me tell you about my dog. It had this problem, you know? <laughs> and now when I say I work in, in computer security, at least 
the general population has an understanding of what that means. So we are seeing some changes, but they are slower, I know, than many of us would, would like to see. Um, but I, I think that, again, when we think about the, the roots and the foundations from, from a lot of the work that we do in, in cybersecurity, and we see this technology explosion, um, one of the important areas that Bruce mentioned um, earlier was the, wh why don't we have systems today that people can beat on, they can pick the wrong solution, they can, and, and the system is, is much better and much able to cope with people. And I think part of that is if you look at where we've been and where we are today, we don't always consider the, the um, user as part of the system. We don't design our systems to make it easy to do the right thing, hard to do the wrong thing, and easy to back up if you do the wrong thing. And maybe we do that because some of our roots came from that national defense perspective. Um, I spend a lot of time in, in meetings with the, the, within the government, and that national economic perspective is critically important today and will be even more important tomorrow and in the future. So we have that defense perspective, that economic perspective, and then we have that user perspective, that consumer, um, and that civil rights perspective that all need to come to the table. And maybe um, part of where we need to change some of our models and some of our work in this space is making sure that all of these areas have equal voices at the table. Today, NIST is very proactively working in that space um, and trying to bring these different perspectives to the table. So um, we at NIST, um, our, our program primarily over the years had been made up of mathematicians, computer scientists, and engineers. Those were the backgrounds, those were the key skills that we looked for when we hired people. Today we have actually hired social scientists and attorneys. And that doesn't sound like a big deal to many of you sitting in the audience. But from the government's perspective and the way NIST is set up, bringing in these non-science science folks didn't feel very real to the, um, to the government as we were trying to hire. So we actually had to go through the challenge of creating a series and getting it put in our portfolio so that we could go out and hire these kinds of diverse individuals. But where we are today, we need that sort of diversity. So a lot of times we think um, of, of diversity not in the ways of the different roles people are playing or the different educational backgrounds that they have. But I think that's important in this field and I think we lack some of that diversity today. Um, we're all improving but we need to do a better job. When it comes to education, I think there's formal education and then there's kind of that experimental education. And we need to bring in both of those into the work that we are doing if we are going to keep pace in cybersecurity and make it a strong enabler for all the great technology changes that we're seeing today that will add tremendous improvements in our lives. But those have to come together. Um, and I'm not sure that we can do it if we only have um, mathematicians, sorry, Meltem, Meltem's part of our crypto technology group, um, or, or only computer scientists or only computer engineers if we don't bring the, the users into the system. And um, we're also doing a lot of work at NIST to think about the business side of of cybersecurity, to be able to talk to folks in, in um, business cases. 
So I had a chance to talk with some of the students, and Bruce kindly let me um, go to the Schmooze uh, student today. And I had great conversations, and when I talked with the students, and I asked them questions about their areas of, of interest, I heard a lot of Im um, important areas like um, network security, penetration testing, um, vulnerability management. So again, all kind of that defense side, which is sort of the realm we play in, how do you improve the security posture of the, of um, really of the nation, is what we're interested in at NIST rather than the offensive side. But um, they talked a lot about um, um, kind of capture the flags and, and those sorts of um, capabilities and things that they were doing in classes. Um, but, but we didn't, I think only one person said they were interested in the policy side. And I think uh, a lot of the interesting and fun discussion in the room, there was not a lot of discussion about how do I bring this in so that it meets what businesses need it to do. Right? How do we bring the business side and the technical side together? Do we make folks understand our language, or are we trying to understand their languages and the work that they are doing? And I think as long as we have that thick line, um, again, the nation is going to suffer in um, without a strong cybersecurity posture, and that's going to affect all of us from a national economic perspective as we lose important information to others. And that um, we have systems we're putting money into security, and people are not seeing improvements because they're going to stop buying this stuff. They're going to, I mean, we already see folks trying to do workarounds because we make it hard, hard to use. And I, I have a, a story that I often tell where I feel somewhat guilty about that. I did a lot of work on public key infrastructure technology, and I remember as one of the final projects that we did with standards bodies, we standardized on error codes. So I remember sitting down in a room um, for like two days looking at different sorts of errors that might come up, like certificate has expired. And I see those exact words come across the screen when I'm at home um, doing something on the net. And what are your choices? What can we do? Ignore it. Ignore it. Click through it. That kind of incentivizes bad behavior. <laughs> That's not the kind of behavior that, that we want to see in this space, right? So, so as we're building capabilities for folks to use, I think having that diversity of teams, looking at the edge cases and thinking about a world that's less than perfect and how will this, um, how will this system, how will this piece of code respond to that is critically important. And I think it starts with the universities. Um, again, I had the great privilege to be able to talk with the kids today. And I ask a question that I've asked um, with different groups for the past five years, and I always get the same answer. When you're in a computer science class, not a cybersecurity class, but when you're in a computer science class, is there any emphasis on cybersecurity or, or building, not just writing a piece of code, but, but writing it securely or thinking about the quality of the code that it does what it's supposed to do and nothing else. Do, do you get asked that? Do you get credit for that? Does, is anybody talking about it? And it still seems to me that we have computer science classes over here and cybersecurity classes over here. And we don't have the diversity that we need in those classes so that there will be people who will raise their hand and say, 
I am passionate about cybersecurity and that's what I want to do for a living versus I want to be a network engineer. And in order to be a good network engineer, I need to consider cybersecurity. We, I need to think about that as part of my job, as part of my role. And we don't always see um, that, that folks are considering that. So I think as we move ahead, we have to start incorporating and building these foundations um, in cybersecurity that um, really put this in context of the use of technology everywhere, every day, and not that we're building capabilities only to be used if you have a strong cybersecurity background. So I think we can make great advances if we think about some of these things. But as I look ahead into the future and where we're headed, I still see that we're always going to face some of the threat challenges that we have today, and they're going to be even greater because there's going to be a greater opportunity for the, for the bad actors. So we'll, we'll still have to keep doing that. Um, we'll have to think about changes in computing. NIST is doing a lot of work in um, quantum-resistant cryptography, Cryptography. We ha actually have a, um, right now. Um, we're in the uh, process of a five-year competition, and as we think about um, quantum computing and the use of quantum computers and the changes that we're seeing um, there, we need to be planning today for what's coming tomorrow, and that is not just how do we incorporate these crypto algorithms, but how do we create uh, an environment where we can use these crypto algorithms and the key management and the protocols can take advantage of them. In other words, how do we change the infrastructure? Um, and I think that's going to be a bigger challenge by far. And some of, some of our colleagues who are working on quantum resistant algorithms when you don't really know exactly what a quantum computer can do and they have to be um, classically secure at the same time feel like that's a daunting change. I worry about getting that infrastructure in place. If you think about public key cryptography that came about in the 19... Um, late 1970s, it wasn't until the mid to late 1990s before we got the key management, the public key infrastructure actually up and started, and we still have a lot of work to do on that. So how many years, how many decades has that been? So we have to get out of our comfort zone and, and say, I need to look around a little bit and think not just about today, but some of the things that I see coming in, in the future, and how am I going to be prepared for those? And um, we do a, a, a pretty good job of that, um, and, and there is a lot of innovation in this space, but I think over the next couple of years, we're going to be asking ourselves some more hard problems so we hear a lot about analytics today and how analytics can help us in cybersecurity. But which do we need more? Do we need analytics for cybersecurity or do we need cybersecurity for analytics? You all are the smart ones. Remember, I said I was the dumbest person in the room. I asked a question, and I just and I'm getting a lot of nods, but I'm not sure which way. What? The latter. Cybersecurity for analytics. Um, NIST is thinking about that and and thinking about the 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 challenge of trying to secure something that's that's designed to ever to be in, in constant motion and, and constant change. So again, we wanna be able to partner with you all to, to do those things. 
We want to continue to partner with you all on the education and the outreach so that um, just like today across the nation, we have a real culture of safety, that we build a culture of cybersecurity for folks so that they have better ideas on the right things to do for themselves, and we give them the right set of tools to do those. As we built out our program, um, so we do the research and the standards and the best practices as many of our tools and things like National Vulnerability Database. But in addition to that, we're actually looking at ways to demonstrate good engineering examples, good security architectures that folks can use and build on. So because um, we need people to be better educated to know what to ask for to create that demand side of things. So one of the other areas that I wanted to just spend a couple minutes talking on um, is something that, that Bruce mentioned, and that's in the area of incentives to get, get things right. I think in the short term, um, we really have to hit vulnerability management we have to, to be creative and, and thinking. We, NIST, are putting out some um, calls to, to look at some examples of ways to, to patch um, different kinds of devices. And I know our colleagues from NTIA, I don't know if Alan Freeman's out here, but I know they're working on some of that as well from a policy side. But we're going to continue need to need to do that. But at the end of the day, how do we incentivize a marketplace that really um, capitalizes on quality, right? So, so we buy, as consumers, a lot of things based on quality, um, things where we're putting our family um, we, we work very hard to minimize their risks, so we might buy a new car because of some of the safety features that are out there. That, that is actually a market differentiator. Now, many of you act as the IT consultant for your families. So when your mother called or your uncle called a little while ago and said they were having pro a problem with their computer, what would you tell them to do? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Thank you. Um, right? That's the standard kind of advice. So if I'm driving from DC back to Gettysburg and my car stops, on the Washington Capitol Beltway, am I gonna be real happy with the product I'm using if I call the manufacturer because I'm stopped on the, on the road, in the middle of the road, and they say, just turn it off and wait like 30 seconds and turn it back on? No, we would not find that acceptable. So we have to find better methods to improve quality. And I think there are some things that we collectively can do in this space and that we need to be doing more of. Com we, need to, we need to remind ourselves of the things that technology does, computers do well. Technology does well. And we need to say, how can we use that to our advantage so that we can have those um, machines give us evidence when we request it about the state that they're in and the kinds of capabilities that they, the security capabilities that we, that, that they're employing at that point in time. That they can actually do, instead of a, a test model where we test it, be, conform, do some conformity tests before we buy or something like that, that we can actually do that in, in real time. We can take advantage of machines for what they do well. And then that, that gives us the opportunity, I think, to look at the margins in the places where we need to get humans more involved. But we need to find ways to create evidence, not just of the bad things that are happening, but the good things that we want to see and that those devices are doing for us at a point in time 
to help us improve quality. So that's both in, in software and in firmware and in hardware. And, and um, I think we still um, do not ask enough of the, of the capabilities to do some of that kind of testing and to be able to demonstrate back for us so that we can use quality as a market differentiator, as a way to be able to buy better products or have better services in this space. And of course, that gets back to the metrics question. And I'm at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. My um, physicist, my Nobel Prize NIST winning NIST Nobel Prize winning physicist will remind me all the time, if you can't measure it, does it really exist? <laughs> and we still can't measure as much as we need to be able to measure in this space. So I think that continues to be a challenge. And at NIST, we have a lot of constructive dialogue about do we want to go down this question on measurement and, and measuring again? Can we really make progress? But I think it's a space where we can and we need to continue to, to improve. So we have um, opportunities for some very practical solutions on things like information sharing and, and um, vulnerability management and threat detection and all kinds of great discussions that you're going to have this um, over the, the weekend on these spaces. But in the long term, I think we need to bring the user more into the picture. We need better incentives and better ways to demonstrate quality um, in what we're doing. And we need to help ourselves prepare more for the future. And we need to be able to have a better dialogue with non-cybersecurity people. We need to be able to, to work with them and to be able to bring that business into what we're doing. And we need to think of cybersecurity as an enabler, not as the end game itself. So with that, I have a couple of asks of you all. I'm really famous for asking things of, of folks. And um, you all are here spending your weekend to learn more, to interact more, because um, you really have a passion for this. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, my first ask of you all is to continue with that creativity. Um, and as you're looking at that kind of creativity, bump yourself out a little bit in, from the space that you're really comfortable with and take another view. Take another look at things. Um, and that's on the space where on, on your projects, on the things that you're working on. So not always are you a, a, a network defender, but you're a software analyst maybe. Maybe look at it from, from that view. Um, I think um, we need to, to continue to, to build and understand the, the business side of the advances in technology and think about how cybersecurity can be an enabler. Um, and, and also from, from a policy perspective, um, it's really important that you all bring your views to the table. But again, that you have that constructive dialogue and that you can think um, not just that I'm a technologist, but I can think about this from the national economic perspective, and I can think of it from the national defense perspective, and I can think of it from the consumer perspective, and I can think about this um, from a, a civil liberties perspective. And sometimes it's like, that's too hard. I'm not one of those folks, but you are, because it is the technology and the data that informs those sorts of policy debates. So you are really, really important to those. And being able to look at different aspects of it is critically important for our nation. 
So, um, and the, the last um, thing that, that I think is, is really important is that integrity and that open and transparent um, dialogue. And again, I've heard that throughout the conference already, but keep that up. NIST has had some bumps in the road. Lots of folks will say, NIST, clipper chip, wasn't that you all? <laughs> yes. Snowden, didn't somebody play around with one of your standards or your best practices? We have had bumps in the road. We have had bumps in the road at NIST, just like every other organization. But by having that open and transparent dialogue and having conversations about that and the things that we've learned from those experiences, I think that we have built a trust in the community. And that's how we're able to, to take advantage and to be able to partner with the smart people who are in this audience and, and the companies with whom you work. And we are ever so grateful for always being able to do that. And I think our integrity, our openness, our transparency, and our willingness to look at this from all sides and to go in and touch and build the technology ourselves, and to have that technical expertise is part of our recipe for success. So I want to um, end by saying we hope that we can continue to work with you all, um, that, that you all continue to think about not just the technical challenges, but where we're going in this space, because it really does affect all of us in all aspects of our lives, and, and it's only going to increase over time. So enjoy these exciting times, and, and think about the things from Consumer Electronics Show that, that you're able to do that you weren't able to do last year. Um, some of the staff came back and gave me some reports on that. I'm not real sure we need some of those devices, but, you know, there's a market for them. That's not mine to decide. But, but that security as an enabler for those is important for me. And it's important for all of us. And, and the challenges are going to be there. For the students in the room, job security is going to be there for a, quite a while as well. So uh, thank you all. And I'd be happy to address any questions you might have from the technology um, to the other stuff that I talked about. Any questions, or I'm, be I'm between you and dinner? Yes. Post. Oh, post dual EC. Um, what have we done to to um, to stop that from happening again? We actually sat down and spent a lot of time thinking about our principles for the for the development of our cryptographic documents. And certainly, I think a big theme for me is trust but verify um, as, as a theme. But we laid out a process, and we are very rigidly following that process with all that we are doing so that we have that open and transparent, um, that we um, address issues and we share those kinds of questions that come up and how we adjudicated them, et cetera. So we actually have a non-technical publication in cryptography on how we develop our standards and best practices. And that's sort of our guiding principles. And we put it out there and got lots of good feedback on that so that we have a, a, a process in place that we can rely on. Yes? Is NIST doing anything with blockchain? Yes, we are. We have um, SANS government shutdown. Um, we have a publication that's coming out on Monday um, on kind of the fundamentals of blockchain to help people understand what blockchain is, what it does for you, and what are some of the things that you have to have in place to, in order to really be able to use blockchain. So we're not, um, we also have, 
um, a project in planning at our National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence where we're looking at some work in identity management and blockchain. Yes. Right. That that and that is a very fair comment. I I think um, so. For those folks on this side of the room that didn't hear it, um, I use the example of the car physically stopped, and I can feel that as a consumer. But if somebody um, takes something from me or borrows some of my compute power for a botnet, which we have a botnet report out, we'd love to get your comments on too, in terms of how the community can help solve some of those challenges. And the fact that they're using my computer and I'm not, what do I care? I don't even know it's happening. So, so you can't use that always as, as a differentiator. Um, but. I think maybe that's why some of the education on this has always been hard, because I can physically see if this chair is here, but if I, if I steal the bits that are a duplicate of it, I still have the, 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 the document or the capability there. And I think that's um, somewhat of an education challenge in terms of how we communicate some of that, those sorts of messages, but also how we make it easier to do the right thing. So, you know, ha the, the patching question as a short-term issue is still a, a, a big challenge, and it's a big challenge for organizations, but um, it's even a bigger challenge for, for individuals. So we have to get better at those things. So, so you are right. And thank you for not throwing a ball at me. I was like, oh, I wonder how many, I wonder if I'm going to come back with a whole sack of balls from this. I can go back to NIST and say, look what I won. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap up the questions. Um, I, I'm looking forward to the blockchain uh, document, if for no other reason than I think that the clarity that you provided um, around cloud with the initial cloud document, I think, helped uh, everyone get their head wrapped around what is cloud with different conceptual ways to think about it and how to move forward. So um, uh, it strikes me, as soon as you said that, that we're in very similar space with blockchain where everybody uses the word, nobody knows what it means. Uh, so that actually sounds kind of exciting, and I'm certainly a naysayer and dart thrower in that space, so maybe it'll convert me. But anyway, um, thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate appreciate that, so thanks to Donna. Um, one, of our, one of our traditions for our keynotes, um, rather than give out a little plaque that you can put in a drawer, we've long <laughs> held it important to give you something very large that you cannot fit in a drawer. Um, so the moose head definitely doesn't fit in a drawer. You have to do something with it. Also, um, I know that there's concerns regarding uh, government employees taking gifts. So this is actually used. Uh, so it has no intrinsic value. It's been hanging on our kitchen wall watching Heidi and I cook dinner for the last year. Just prepared for these kind of events. There's always a spare used moose in the house to give to someone from the government. So it's no intrinsic value. So that thing probably smells of bacon and eggs and, and ham and all kinds of other things that we've cooked in our house. So. Uh, uh, anyway, as a token of appreciation, have a moose head. So thank, thank you very you. much, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. I will put it up in my office. <laughs> and Fire Talks will be in here at uh, 8 o'clock, so you got a little time to go get a drink and some food.
Sure. I've got work for you tomorrow. Great. That's okay? perfect. Thank you All so right. much.